Um, I am uh, so thankful to be here this morning, and I wanted to thank all of you and Tripp and Laura and, and Morris and everyone for the very warm welcome and the wonderful opportunity to be here with you this day and to help lead in the worship of God. <clears throat> um, I am, I am uh, going to invite you this morning if you would pray with me before I begin. Dear God, <clears throat> we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, and open our souls as we are gathered here today with each one of uh, each with each other and with you in your presence this day. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As I begin to prepare for this sermon, I begin to meditate on text. And this first Samuel text really resonated with me. Now, saying that an Old Testament text resonates with me and saying that I'd like to preach on it isn't always something that happens, particularly during Lent. Usually, I'd choose to focus on the gospel text, Jesus' life on our way to Jerusalem, journeying with him on these 40-plus days of Lent. But as I read 1 Samuel, I couldn't take my eyes away from this passage, in particular verse 7. If you have your text in front of you, I'm going to invite you to follow along as I reread the words of this verse from that JPS translation. But the, but the Lord said to Samuel, pay no attention to his appearance or his stature, for I have rejected him. For not as man sees, does the Lord see. Man sees only what is visible, but the Lord sees into the heart. Now, wait a minute. Did you see that? Or rather, did you hear that? There's a word that I said as I read that translation that you don't always see in every other translation. And if you're reading from a Bible that's not a JPS version, you probably noticed it too. Did you catch it? It's the word see. In most versions of the Bible, this word in verse 7 is translated as look or looks. But as you noted after hearing it today and hearing me reading it, the translation I'm using and referring to today says see or sees. You may be wondering why that is. And if you are, I'd say you're in good company because this one word captured my attention as I prepared to write this sermon. This one word difference in translation really grabbed my interest. Why look versus see? Those are two different words. And as I thought about it, I really thought perhaps I just looked at it wrong. So I consulted a, a few more translations of the Bible, and in each one where I looked again, there it was. And I couldn't quite understand it. I kept looking at it again and again, one Bible after the next. I guess I just had to see it to believe it. As it turns out, seeing and believing are both at the heart of our text today. <clears throat> As my two wonderful Bible professors, Dr. David Garber and Dr. Angela Parker, have taught me to begin to sit with a text and try to read meaning out of it and really get to the heart of it, along with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, means I must begin with a scripture's context. And the context of the book of 1 Samuel is a bit complicated. It's even a little bit confusing. And in fact, certain portions of the book's narrative will leave you scratching your head, maybe pulling out another version or two, and perhaps thinking you can't believe what you're seeing, or in this case, reading. The book of 1 Samuel was originally one large book <clears throat> containing both 1 and 2 Samuel. The Septuagint, which was the first Greek translation of the Old and New Testament first divided that large narrative of Samuel into the two books that we now have in our current Christian Bible, 
The book is so named for its central character, Samuel, to whom Jewish sources ascribe most of the book's composition. However, other sources ascribe the book's composition to a group of several anonymous authors called the Deuteronomists. These authors are thought to be responsible for the composition of several books within the Old Testament called the Deuteronomistic History. I practice that, Deuteronomistic History. There's a few, few syllables in there. <laughs> These authors are thought to be, um, they, they, these, they think that these authors are responsible for um, <clears throat> the books of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. These books tell the story of Israel's history from the conquest under Joshua into the promised land to the end of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The exact date of the book's composition varies from 586 BCE following the Babylonian exile to the reign of King Josiah to the earlier pre-exilic period, depending on which sources you follow. The narrative, short songs, lists, and brief notices which make up the book of 1 Samuel describe the transition from the rule of the judges like Deborah to the monarchic system of government in ancient Israel. In our text today, the immediate context of 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 3, is Samuel's anointing of David as the future king of Israel. However, the immediate preceding context is Saul's rejection by God. If you have a Bible, turn with me to chapter 15. At this point in the text, Saul has been rejected as God's anointed leader of God's people because he has rejected God. He has failed to obey God's command. Instead of fulfilling the entire prescription for complete and utter destruction of all the Amalekites, Saul looked upon the best that kingdom of the world had to offer, and he decided to keep it for himself to do as he saw fit, and only prescribed that which was cheap and worthless, as the text says. And then he built a monument to his and not God's success. Saul had looked upon the power and the prestige and the bountiful spoils awarded to him from his earthly success, and instead of being honest about what he did, Saul convinced himself that he had done and was still doing what he believed God called and commanded him to do. But God did not see it that way. If you look in verse 10, it says, The word of the Lord then came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from me and has not carried out my commands. Samuel, at hearing this, was distressed. And he entreated the Lord all night long. But early in the morning, Samuel went to meet Saul. And when he did, Samuel was told that Saul had gone to Carmel, where he had erected a monument for himself. Well, once he finally finds Saul in verses 13 all the way up to through 15, and he finds Saul, and Saul begins to tell him all about what he did and how he followed the command from God, and he's, he's really got some ways that he's going to live out that command. He starts to tell Samuel all about it until you get to verse 16, and Samuel says to Saul, Stop! Let me tell you what the Lord told me last night. Samuel said, you may look small to yourself, but you are the head of the tribes of Israel. The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission, saying, go and prescribe the Amalekites. And in verse 19, why did you disobey the Lord and swoop down on the spoil in defiance of the Lord's will? After having stayed up all night in distress, as it says in verse 11, it almost seems as if Samuel, if you look forward to verses 22 and 23, seems to shout that he cannot believe what he is seeing or hearing as he replies to Saul and says, Does the Lord delight 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to the Lord's command. Surely obedience is better than sacrifice, compliance than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, defiance like the iniquity of teraphim. Because you rejected the Lord's command, he has rejected you as king. The king whom God had chosen as a leader for God's people has been rejected. The king who who was appointed and anointed to lead God's people with wisdom and strength has been rejected. Samuel's grief and God's regret. You'd have to see it to believe it. Today's scripture picks up God's story following the scene of rejection, regret, and grief over Saul's failures in leadership of God's people. Today's scripture begins to fill in the lines of God's story with God's people as Samuel is called by God to gather himself and his holy oil and travel to Jesse, Jesse the Bethlehemite, from whose sons God tells Samuel he has chosen a new king for God's people. And at this point in the story, Samuel is blinded by grief and perhaps unbelief and questions the way before him, fearful and confused. But remember, God sees the heart. And as Samuel watches each of Jesse's sons appear, noticing their physical appearances and sizing up their royal potential, he starts to believe as each one appears, Eliab, Abinadab, Shema, and all seven of the oldest brothers, that surely these seven such imposing statures would garner royal consideration. Samuel is looking to the man, but God sees the heart. Finally, Jesse's youngest, smallest shepherding son is called to come before God's prophet. And just as Samuel began to size up this ruddy-cheeked, most unlikely of royal exemplars, God sees and God speaks. Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel rose and did what the Lord commanded. And from then on, the text tells us, the Holy Spirit gripped David. The leader of God's people, unlikely, discounted, not ideal, is the one whom God calls, the one whom God chooses, the one whom God anoints, and the one whom the Holy Spirit embraces. Seeing is believing. Now, on this Sunday of March, Baptist Women in Ministry Advocacy Month and Women's History Month, you may be wondering, Why have I chosen to preach from this text? I wondered myself as I began to look at this text and ponder it and consider it. And as I did, I began, I feel, to see its heart. And I believe that the heart of this text witnesses to its truth. The truth that the appearance of qualified leadership, which we as God's people designate as authoritative, does not always recognize, see, or believe the heart or the image of those whom God ordains and affirms and anoints. We as God's people have looked upon the physical appearance of women articulating a call from God to ministerial leadership, and we have not seen God's anointing in their heart. We as God's people have looked upon the physical appearance of our daughters seeking affirmation, and we have thrown up roadblocks 
so that we cannot see her as the pastor whom God has called and ordained her to become. We as God's people have looked upon the stature and the nature and the marital and parental status of of women fearfully and wonderfully made creations of our living God and we have turned a blind eye to the indwelling of the Spirit within each woman's imago Dei as we ask in pastoral search committees, are these all the boys you have? Seeing is believing. As I sat in last summer's Baptist Women in Ministry luncheon at Wilshire Baptist Church in Dallas, I was handed a colorful booklet. I read the front cover and it said, State of Women in Baptist Life, Report 2021. I was intrigued and almost immediately began to look inside at its its contents. Now, this past summer was my first time ever attending the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship's General Assembly and my first time attending BWIM's luncheon and my first time reading that State of Women in Baptist Life report. And as lunch began, the report was presented by BWIM's leadership. As I sat and listened to the presentation, I followed along within the book and I looked at the facts and figures on the pages concerning women's experiences in ministerial leadership, which included statistics detailing the prevalent use of male exclusive pronouns for God, the limited and often unclear process of ordination, the frequent compensation and classification iniquity, which is even more pronounced for women of color, the multitude of examples of workplace discrimination, which are even more also pronounced for women of color, and the whopping 25% figure representing Baptist women who experience harassment and assault while employed in ministerial leadership. Well, I have to tell you, as a seminary student who feels called by God to pastoral ministry, the look and the appearance of the state of women in Baptist life made me feel intense grief and much regret. All at once, I caught myself wondering if any Baptist church was going to see in me what God sees in me. Will God's people look at me and see God's call in my life? Will God's people look at me and affirm God's anointing upon my life? Will God's people look at me and embrace me as the Spirit has embraced me? Will God's people see me and all women called by God to ministry? Will God's people believe me? and all women called by God to ministry. If seeing is believing, well, that's quite the appearance, isn't it? Ever since reading that 2021 report, it has gripped me. I haven't stopped thinking about it, and I haven't stopped writing about it, and I haven't stopped praying about it. And in much the same way, ever since I read today's scripture and looked at it and considered it, it has gripped me. And as I consider the heart of this text and its context, I can't stop wondering, what does God see and what does God believe? What does God regret and what does God grieve? When for years, as the BWIM report indicates, we as people, as God's people within God's church, have witnessed dwindling numbers of female pastors, obstacles to women's affirmation and ordination, workplace discrimination and iniquity, and growing numbers of women who experience harassment and assault while employed in ministerial leadership, I wonder how God grieves. And I wonder if God feels regret for those whom God 
anointed to lead God's people. If seeing really is believing, then perhaps our scripture text today can offer a word to my heart and maybe yours too. Look with me if you have a text, and if not, I'm going to read it. Don't worry. Look at verse 12 in chapter 16. The words of God ring out to Samuel in his grief, in his despair, in his fear, and perhaps even in his unbelief. Rise and anoint, for this is the one. On this Sunday of Baptist Women in Ministry Month of Advocacy, as I have been praying and as I have been thinking and as I have been gripped perhaps by the Spirit myself, I believe God's words to Samuel might have a word to speak to us today. A word that inspires us towards new action where we might see and come to believe with our whole hearts in a newness for God's people. A newness in which God might inspire us to rise and anoint, adopting practices of naming our creator in ways which are inclusive of all creation. A newness in which God might inspire us to rise and anoint, empowering female leaders in our midst whom God has called to ministry by crafting accessible pathways towards the process of ordination. A newness in which God might inspire us to rise and anoint, reforming compensation and classification models within our church workspaces so that women and all leaders who serve in ministry might experience equity. A newness in which God might inspire us to rise and anoint, remodeling our ministry workspaces with designs on policies and provisions which enable parity and facilitate fairness, and a newness in which God might inspire us to rise and anoint, listening to the truth of women's experiences and educating ourselves about prevention, protection, and reporting, so that the lives of women called by God to serve in ministry might do so in flourishing and full vitality. The newness of God for the people of God. Can we see it? Can we believe it? If seeing really is believing, then we, as the gathered community of faith here, marking this journey along with Jesus in the season of Lent, we should be able to believe with our whole heart in the appearance of newness. For as we know, at the end of these 40 days, we will mark and we will celebrate the ultimate appearance of God's newness in the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. The anointed action that changed the story of God's people and all of creation forevermore. That joyful Easter morning, three women were called by God to look and see and believe with their whole hearts in the brilliant appearance of our risen Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene, Mary, and Joanna rose to preach the good news to God's people that Jesus Christ was God's anointed one. The newness now in flesh reappearing God's gift of salvation to all the world. We can affirm that the newness of God for the people of God is seen in Jesus Christ because women called by God rose to preach and proclaim the truth of the good news. When we 
as members of the church, hear God's call and we rise and anoint, testifying to truth in our actions, words, and deeds today on this Sunday in Baptist Women in Ministry Advocacy Month and in every day that is to come, God's people will be gripped by the Spirit and they will look with their whole hearts to rejoice and proclaim with all creation that seeing really is believing. Amen.